Hi, I'm Brendan. When I was five, my kindergarten teacher, Ms. Hebert, taught me and the rest of the class the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The rule stuck with me. Clearly, I can still remember it being taught it when I was five years old. And I'd like to think that I applied it as best as I could throughout my childhood, into adolescence, and even into adulthood. And it turns out, Miss Hebert wasn't the only one teaching this rule. In fact, variations of the rule exist across many cultures and many faith systems. It shows up in Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and the list goes on. Now, I want to do a little experiment, so you've got to bear with me, and I promise I'll circle back around to the golden rule. And for my experiment, I actually need a volunteer from the audience. You're just going to have to come up on stage. It'll take a minute. It'll be super easy. Okay, everybody's looking down. Yeah, will you be my volunteer? Awesome. So just come up around up the stairs over there. All right, and as I say, it's going to be real easy. I just need you to come up to me and introduce yourself to me as though we're meeting for the first time, which in fact we are. <laughs> Hello, I'm Hi. Drew. Nice Drew. to meet you. Nice to meet you, Drew. I'm Brendan. Hi, Brendan. Now, Drew, tell me, how does it feel if we start talking like this? Um, good. <laughs> okay, how are you feeling? Okay. So okay, on the edge a bit. On the edge a little bit. Okay, because we're standing too close, right? And too close generally means either something aggressive or intimate, both of which are inappropriate for our first meeting like yes. this. <laughs> okay, so let me just back up a little. Okay, okay? I'm going to back up a little bit. How does it feel if we're having a conversation right about here? Um, like you don't like me? Okay. <laughs> okay, so it's a little distance, a little distant. Yeah, maybe you smell a little, a little unfocused. Maybe I'm coming across even a little aloof. Okay, so stay where you are still. I need you to help me out. So I'm going to start moving forward, and you let me know when I'm in the right spot in front of Drew. How's this? Keep going? How about now? How about here? A little more? How about here? Still more. How about this? Oh, a lot of people saying yes. What about this? No. Somebody's trying to set you up and say keep going. Okay, so right, this is it right here? It's good, for you, good by you as well? Okay, thank you very much. Let's give Drew a hand for helping me out. Okay. So let me ask you this. How many of you, when you were a kid, had a parent, maybe a teacher, they sat you down, and they said, this is how far you should stand from another person. I'm guessing none of us. None of us were overtly taught this. And yet all of us knew the difference between hilariously, embarrassingly too close and comfortably just right. Now, we must have learned it. We learned it through observation, through experience, trial and error. But it wasn't conscious. So this sense of space that we have is one example of our unconscious competence. We don't think about it, and, and we're good at it. In fact, we're really good at it. Our sense of space is really quite nuanced. It changes ever so slightly depending on whether you're speaking with a stranger, a friend, a family member, if it's a social setting, a professional setting, if it's a crowded room, if it's not a crowded room. So, it really makes up, as I say, one example of, of, of our norms, the things that we call normal and don't really think much about. But what happens, what happens when our norms differ across cultures and facets of diversity? Because they do. We know that from different cultures, their sense of space is somewhat different. And so I could be standing speaking with somebody who's too close, and I might just think, you know what, I'm just going to take a little step back to get it just right again. And that person might be thinking, well, why is he stepping back? I'm kind of not focused now. He's a little bit aloof. I'll just take a little step forward. And we could end up doing this dance all the way around the room, trying to make it just right, trying to do unto the other person as we'd like them to do to us. So this brings us back around to the golden rule. The trouble with the golden rule is it's ethnocentric by nature. It assumes that what's good for me is good for you and it ignores all our individual differences in norms. So we don't have to cross countries to, to realize this. Uh, I can give you an example. I'm a big extrovert. And so if I were at a party and I saw two people standing off on the side having a conversation together, my inclination would be to bring them and draw them into the large group. 
Because if I was at a party and I was standing off on the side, that's what I would want. But those two people, maybe they're introverts, might be having the best part of their night right there. And I would be ruining it by trying to do to them what I would want done to me. So the golden rule focuses a lot on sameness, on equality. And usually we think of equality as a good thing. I would put forward that we should be focusing more heavily on equity or fairness. Take a look at this picture. You may have seen this one before. The kids on the left are being treated with sameness, with equality. The kids on the right are not being treated the same at all. They're being treated equitably. They're being treated with fairness. Each one is having their unique needs met such that they can meet the goal, and that is to see the game. So there's a difference between sameness and fairness. And with that, I want to recommend an upgrade to the rule. And that is the platinum rule. The platinum rule states, do unto others as you would have, as, sorry, do unto others as they would have you do unto them. The key here is that we're finally focusing on the receiver, the them and the they. Okay, we're finally paying attention to the person whose needs we're trying to meet. I think it's a good rule. I think it's a great rule, actually. But notice that it comes at a price. The, the, the platinum rule is more of an investment than the golden rule. It requires that you make a, build a relationship with the person. At the very least, you have to ask them what their needs are. And so it takes more time. And sometimes the platinum rule just isn't realistic. Sometimes you have to make assumptions, you have to make generalizations. Sometimes you're communicating to a large population, such that having a one-on-one -on -one conversation to uncover unique needs just isn't realistic. Still, some of you might be thinking, you know what, I'm going to do the platinum rule because it's a good thing or the right thing to do. Well, that's noble. My experience, though, is that the things that we do because they're a good thing or the right thing are some of the first things that fall off the table when there's pressures on time, on resources, and when we have competing priorities. So my recommendation is to consciously, intentionally invest in the platinum rule, to really weigh it out. Look at, okay, these are, this is the time it's going to take me, this is the effort it's going to take to meet these needs, and is that outweighed by the value that comes of it? I believe that it will be. If we take students, for example, we know from Alf Lizio's research that if we invest in and focus on the needs of students, needs around a sense of connection with the institution, sense of resourcefulness for the campus, a sense of purpose for education, we know that students are more likely to persist and to succeed. Imagine even further if, as students, you had the opportunity to create your own definition of success. And it's no different with employees. We know, again, from research, employees, if employers invest in creating a space, an environment, a culture, such that employees are able to bring their full, unique selves to the workplace, they're more likely to be engaged. And we know that employee engagement correlates strongly with productivity, innovation, etc. And I'd speculate that as citizens, if we were able to have our needs met, such that we could bring our best selves forward, that we'll be able to contribute most greatly to our cities and to our communities. And I wonder, when we think across countries and across cultures, when we think across conflicts, if we were to invest heavily into understanding our neighbors' needs and not just having our needs understood, I wonder what we could achieve. I hope we'll find out. Thank you.